Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this live stream to help answer some questions about the spread of the COVID-19 virus in our mountain towns and our communities. My name is David Krause. I'm the editor of the Aspen Times and the lead of the editor group for Swift Communications, which has publications in Colorado, Utah, and California. We will be hosting this live stream for about the next 45 minutes, and we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Glenn Mays, who is a professor and chair at the Colorado School of Public Health. The editors of our papers have, set a com uh, have a set of common questions that we've put together to ask Dr. Mays, and we invite you to send your questions on this feed as well, and we'll get to those at about 2.30 for the last part of our 45-minute session. If you are joining us via Zoom, I ask that you hit your mute button now so that we can have clear audio throughout the presentation. Look out. I'd like to quickly introduce the editors in each of the communities that we serve. In Colorado, we have Lisa Schlickman at the Steamboat Pilot in today. We have Nate Peterson at the Vail Daily. Nicole Miller at the Summit Daily News. Peter Bowman at the Glenwood Springs Post Independent. Eli Pace at Sky High News, which serves Grand County. Josh Carney at the Craig Press, and Kyle Mills at the Rifle Citizen Telegram. Working to the west, we have Bubba Brown at the Park Record in Park City, Utah. And in California, we have Brian Hamilton at the Sierra Sun and Grass Valley Union, and Bill Rozak at the Tahoe Tribune. Also, we are working out on the plains with our agricultural publications, including editors Carrie Statham and Mariah Wormer at the Tri-State Livestock News and Farm Rancher Exchange. Just so our viewers know, after this live stream, we will post this Q&A to all of our websites and social media. And with that, I'd like to turn over our conversation to Kelly Geary Agnew, who is our marketing strategist for Swift Communications and has been working with our editors on this project and she'll do the uh, next 30 minutes of Q&A with Dr. Mays. So uh, Kelly and Dr. Mays, please take it away. Great, thank you, David. All right, so real quick, I wanna ask uh, our guest and speaker, Glenn Mays with the Colorado School of Public Health to introduce himself and just tell us a little bit about uh, his expertise and why he's uh, talking to us about the new coronavirus and COVID-19 today. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for the chance to join you. Um, again, I'm, I'm Glenn Mays, uh, Professor and Chair of the Department of Health Systems Management and Policy in the Colorado School of Public Health, um, based here at University of Colorado on the Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, I've spent about two decades uh, in the field of uh, public health research and health systems research uh, specifically, and my um, area of work really studies how health systems and public health systems can uh, best uh, prepare for and, re and respond to uh, emerging health threats uh, like the one that we're all dealing with now, coronavirus, as well, there, as, well as other types of, um, of hazards that emerge that can affect health status for, for large groups of people. So um, very, uh, very glad to be with you here today. All right, great. Thanks, Glenn. So uh, as Dave mentioned, we've got a couple of questions that we've put together for common things that we've been hearing across all the markets that we work in. Um, so we're gonna run through those before we get to audience submitted questions. All right, so to start us off, how is the new coronavirus different from the flu? I think you hear a lot about, especially as it was first emerging, it's similar to the flu. Why do we need to be you know, more worried about this than we are about anything else, um, et cetera. But, How's it different in symptoms, how it spreads, how contagious it is? Yeah, so this is a, this is a viral infection, the, the coronavirus, and so is the flu. So there are a number of commonalities, particularly in, uh, in symptoms. Um, uh, coronavirus kind of the signature symptoms are fever, uh, dry cough, uh, shortness of breath. Um, uh, you can also have some, some muscle pain and fatigue. Um, and many of those symptoms are also, uh, also encountered with, uh, with influenza infection. I would say the shortness of breath is probably the one 
one is more of a distinguishing factor that's that's related to coronavirus, and you're less likely to see that in influenza, um, particularly in the early early stages of an influenza infection. So shortness of breath is one symptom that pro, that is um, that really more um, more distinguishes coronavirus from uh, from flu. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, um, the how infectious this uh, coronavirus is compared to the regular flu. flu. Um, it does appear to be significantly um, more infectious or uh, more contagious. The, the reproduction rate is one of the um, measures that we use to measure level of contagiousness, how quickly that it spreads. Um, and our uh, and again, we're still learning about the coronavirus, but the, our you know best evidence today suggests the reproduction rate for coronavirus is about 2.2, meaning for every person who has uh, the infection, they're like on average they are likely to spread it to about to, to more more than two additional people. Uh, for regular seasonal flu, that reproduction rate is more like 1.3. So. Coronavirus is much has a much higher reproduction rate, almost twice as high as the flu, and that's one factor that makes us this more more concerning is that it's spreading more rapidly um, across the population. Um, in terms of its overall severity, we also talk a lot about the mortality rate, and it's true lots of people die every year from seasonal influenza, uh, but the mortality uh, rate from coronavirus also appears to be significantly higher than the mortality rate that we see from, from seasonal, seasonal flu. Uh, an order of magnitude, larger, higher mortality for coronavirus. Uh, typical seasonal flu, we, uh, only about a tenth of 1% of people who are infected with seasonal flu uh, die from it. With coronavirus, again, we still have some uncertainty around that estimate, but it's somewhere between one and 2% are our best estimates of the, of the mortality rate from coronavirus. So it's much more deadly and much more contagious. Good to know. All right, our next question, how is it transmitted? Um, and one thing that I think we're wondering about, it seems like there's different information, how long it can live um, on surfaces. You talked about transmission from person to person. Um, so how is it transmitted? How long does it live? And then what's the best way to, to keep it from lasting too long on, on those surfaces and other materials? Sure. Yeah. And, and again, you know, the science on this has continued to evolve over time. This is a disease that we didn't know existed until just a few, a few months ago. Uh, but the major route of transition appears uh, is, is definitely from uh, droplets that are spread person to person in, you know, from, uh, from the breath, from coughing or sneezing, or just from talking uh, in close quarters, droplets that, um, that are transmitted from, from person uh, to person. Um, and uh, uh, it does not appear that the, the coronavirus, um, uh, that the simply, you know, uh, that breathing the air that, from, that has been um, breathed by, by people with, with uh, this condition, that aerosol, the ability of the virus to be aerosoled, um, that does not appear to be a major risk for the coronavirus. Um, uh, but it is, the mo major route is droplet transmission, being in close proximity to someone uh, who may, you know, be be talking or, or sneezing or, or, or coughing. Now it's also true those droplets, those droplets can land on surfaces um, uh, and then be exchanged person to person that way or through you know uh, handshakes for example that's why we're, we're trying to um, discourage people from, um, from uh, handshaking um, and so it's also possible to transmit from you know droplets that land on surfaces or on clothing doorknobs that that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the research suggests that the, you know that the virus can remain alive on surfaces like that from anywhere from a few hours to potentially a day or two, uh, depending on the surface and on the, you know things like temperature and the other conditions. Um, uh, and so that's that's why it's important you know for you know to, to exercise um, strong you know cleaning um, strategies, particularly in public areas, uh, in schools, you know doorknobs, services, tables. Uh, the, those kinds of things where, um, you know, where uh, people are potentially could be leaving these, uh, you know, these um, infectious agents. Uh, for washing uh, clothing and cleaning services, uh, uh, for, again, soap and water, uh, the best way, you know, for, for uh, cleaning your hands um, and th those kinds of things. Uh, for washing clothing, the recommendation is just using traditional detergent, washing, washing them, 
uh, on as high a temperature as your clothing can stand, um, uh, and then drying clothing thoroughly. So I'm someone who usually doesn't use a dryer for my clothes, but I'm using the dryer now because that can certainly help, help to eliminate the virus. Um, for surfaces, cleaning agents uh, that include, you know, that have alcohol or bleach are, are the ones that are recommended by CDC now. Alcohol content of at least 70%. Uh, bleach using the standard uh, ratio of about a third of a cup to every gallon of water, um, those strategies, or other cleaning um, agents that are designed, you know, for, for disinfecting. Uh, those, those should all work for cleaning surfaces, doorknobs, tables, and those kind of things. Great. Good to know. Good to know about high temperature. I hadn't thought of that. What, so what should I do if I, if I think I might be infected, if I'm worried? Um, what, what are next steps I should take? When should I contact my doctor? How long should I wait? That kind of thing. Yeah, the important thing to recognize about the coronavirus is that for most people who are, who are affected are not going to develop serious complications um, that, act, that require any medical intervention. Uh, so we, we've got, we have to recognize that for most of us um, who are healthy, um, if we, uh, a lot of us are going to be at some point infected by this virus, um, and um, most of us, they're, they're not going to require uh, medical intervention. So if you have mild symptoms that would not otherwise trigger you to, uh, to visit a hospital or visit your, your physician, um, uh, there's, um, there's not a, a need to, to contact the, the doctor. In fact, um, you know, one of our biggest concerns with this outbreak is that this virus is that uh, we have the you know, potential for our, our healthcare systems to be overwhelmed with a surge in demand. And so for people who are, who are just ex are experiencing the regular symptoms of a cold, uh, which are, um, which are, which uh, are parallel to the you know, symptoms of a coronavirus, if you just have a mild fever, a dry cough, um, uh, but it's something that you can manage on your own with, with traditional, you know, with over the counter medications, we encourage you to just practice, you know, the um, safe um, strategies of, um, uh, of you know, self, uh, isolating yourself um, from, from, from other people so you're not spreading the disease. Really, uh, the recommendation is to contact your doctor if, you're, if your symptoms are getting worse um, and are, are really, you know, starting to, um, to um, you know, uh, cause problems for you. In particular, shortness of breath. If you're starting to have trouble uh, breathing and, and shortness of breath is interfering with your ability to um, care for yourself, uh, that's the time to call, to call your doctor. Great. Good to know. Very clear there. All right, moving along. This is coming up a lot, I think, for us, especially because we're all newspapers. Um, why is only limited information uh, released about people who've tested positive? There, there may be some privacy concerns there that need to be considered. Um, and if people are concerned that they maybe have come into contact with someone without knowing it, what, what steps would we recommend they take? Yeah, this is a very important question. And um, the, the, the answer here, there are both uh, legal and but more importantly, public health reasons why uh, information, what uh, is protected and, and maintained private only for individuals who have tested positive for, for coronavirus. Um, the, uh, on the, the legal front, we, we have a law that's been on the books since the early 1990s, the uh, HIPAA Health Information Privacy and um, uh, uh, Protection Act uh, that guarantees that personal information uh, about a person's health condition and medical intervention uh, is required by law to be held um, uh, to that information required to be protected uh, and not, not released. Um, uh, and, and all the medical care institutions and public health agencies are required to keep that information private um, and to only disclose it to other people who need the information to help uh, respond to or treat that condition. Um, the, the public health reason for keeping this information private is we do not want to discourage individuals com from coming forward who potentially um, have the condition um, and, and need to be tested. Um, and it's very, it's very important that, uh, that um, the public um, uh, is, is not, um, we don't create disincentives for them for, from coming forward and, and being tested and um, uh, for, for, this, for this condition. So that, that is, those two reasons are why um, legally and from a public health standpoint, we have to protect the 
privacy and confidentiality about, about in, individuals who, um, who test positive for this condition. Now, the public health community, uh, when they have that, that, this information about individuals who test positive, that information is, uh, is immediately transmitted to state and public health, state and, and local public health authorities, and they are the uh, agencies that use the information to do what's called contact tracing. They do a very careful job of tracing back uh, for every positive case, they trace back all of the individuals who have come in contact with that individual, that positive case, during the potential window in which they were infected. Um, and as well as they, they identify all the places where uh, positive cases have been, all the people who may have come in contact with, um, with that person. And they, they do the checking and notification uh, and then supporting the, the uh, isolation of those individuals who may have been infected by the positive cases. It's a, uh, it's a well um, developed public health strategy, this contact tracing. And we really, we've got to rely on our public health officials to do that work. Um, and, uh, and again, these privacy protections are part and parcel of what makes that strategy work, work so well. Um, so if you are concerned about where a patient was and when, the best thing to do is to, um, uh, again, listen to the information um, that's being released by your local, uh, your, your local public health agency is really the first and best source of information about the about that information, about that if there are settings that where they are concerned about where there may have been exposures and contamination, your local public health agency will be the one to provide that, have that information and, and share that information. Great. Good to know. All right. This is a new term that we learned that we have never heard of before. So talk a little bit about what's the science behind social distancing and why the radius for social distancing is six feet. Yeah, so this, uh, this is another well-established public health practice based in strong science that applies to many types of, um, uh, of, of uh, infectious diseases, viral infectious diseases like, um, like what we're dealing with with the coronavirus. Um, it, is, it is based on a lot of strong research, uh, uh, including research that has been done, been done over the last few months specifically around this uh, novel coronavirus as well as other other infectious agents that are transmitted primarily through droplets, uh, which is the case for this coronavirus, as well as for um, in influenza and other, um, uh, other um, uh, viral infections. And the range of six feet is primarily, is that is the range, as a maximum range that, that droplets are likely to travel when they either, whether they come out of the mouth or the nose or um, other places before gravity pulls them to the ground. Droplets, can, droplets cannot be suspended in air uh, indefinitely. Uh, they are larger particles. They are pulled to the ground eventually. Uh, and six feet uh, is, um, is what the research shows us is kind of that maximum range. So if you're outside of six feet, speaking with another person, even if that person sneezes or coughs or, or talks loudly at you, uh, you're unlikely to get uh, to be um, exposed through, through droplets, which is, again, the primary mode of, tra of transmission for this virus. Right. Makes sense. So we know Droplets can't travel that, that radius. Thanks to gravity, gravity yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so this is kind of a, a question that I think maybe has a, a broad answer, um, but should people continue their daily routine? If they're healthy, they don't have a fever, they don't have a cough, um, is there a chance that they are carrying it without symptoms? Um, and if they're not carrying it, is it okay to kind of continue around daily routines um, or should people try to try to uh, change their behavior to uh, stem the Okay, everybody, we are back after our uh, quick uh, power outage in Denver uh, at Dr. May's house. So sorry about that. We're going to keep going with the questions and Kelly and uh, Dr. Mays will keep going on that and then we will get to some of the viewer questions. So uh, Kelly, why don't you and the doctor keep going on where we were when we uh, lost power? Sure, so I think the question that we were working on was whether or not people should continue their daily routine. If they're not showing any symptoms, is it safe to go about your day to day or should you maybe avoid doing those things? Um, and maybe that depends on how severe the outbreak is in, in your area and where you're located. 
Yeah, so this is this is an important question. It's one, the answer really has evolved pretty considerably over the last couple of weeks for, for us here in the US. Um, we, we uh, you know, the bottom line is that we know that we're seeing pretty widespread evidence of community trans transmission of this virus in most parts of the country now. Um, and so that's the reason for these now these stronger um, recommendations and policies being put in place around around social distancing, around minimizing our interaction um, with with other with other people in the community. Um, in general, I would say, you know, unless um, unless you've got a uh, uh, unless you've got a job that's kind of a, the critical. Um, Critical um, position in your community, a healthcare worker, or another um, member of you know essential personnel. Uh, we really should try to in our daily routines to limit uh, interaction uh, with with other people that could create an opportunity for um, for, for disease transmission. So um, uh, you know, we all have to you know continue with with certain um, activities around you know. Uh, uh, grocery shopping and getting food and making sure we've got the other uh, essentials taken care of. Um, but while we're doing those daily those activities in our daily routines, keep keeping in mind, you know, social dis distancing where we can, the, the six foot rule, and making sure we're being real careful with hand, rock, hand washing and other things. So that's a good lead in kind of to our next question. You talked a little bit about it. You know, there are still those times when you're going to have to go outside if you've got to get groceries or whatever that is. What should I keep in mind if, I, if I've got to go out? Um, how do I keep myself and others safe? Yeah, the main thing is try to try to avoid being in being in cl close proximity to large groups of people. Um, otherwise, it's you know it's safe to go outside and and um, uh, in terms of you know getting out for your daily activities, getting out for exercise uh, and other other kinds of activities. Just trying to minimize um, close proximity to to other people in particular. Larger, larger groups of people. The CDC recommendation now is try to avoid, you know, being in groups of ten or more, uh, which is a pretty small group. But, but that's that's the recommendation now, and that's the main way to keep yourself uh, safe is trying to again avoid situations where you're in close close proximity um, to to uh, uh, other people. All right, great. So this is an interesting one, and we want to just get your take on this as kind of an expert in the public health field. What, what are your thoughts on when we might see the peak and when we might see things start to return to normal? Yeah, and this, this is another question where the science is evolving on this, and we're mostly uh, uh, the answers to this is by, uh, generated largely by looking at the trajectory that has happened in other, other countries. Um, and looking at what, what's happened now, you know, now in China, South Korea, and parts of Europe, um, the, the thought is that uh, we are at least looking at probably, probably eight to 12 weeks um, before we might see the um, beneficial effects of these social distance, distancing strategies kick in and, and begin to see um, the downward slope of this um, epidemiology curve for this, for this disease. If we look at in China, they're just now announcing, you know, no new cases um, after a solid two months of implementing very strong uh, control and mitigation strategies. And so likely we're also looking at, again, an eight to 12 month, uh, an eight to 12 week period, two to three months uh, before we might be able to see, be able to relax um, these kind of strategies. So basically people can kind of expect, you know, social distancing and all these things that we've been talking about, to, they want to keep those in place for at least that period of time so that we start to see those declines. That's my expectation is that we're going to see these recommendations to stay in place for, uh, you know, at least an eight, at least an eight week period uh, to, to the, until we can see evidence of uh, transmission slowing sharply. All right, great. So that's a lot of good information. I think that's really helpful to, to us and to our readers. We gathered a lot of questions on our websites and on our Facebook live feeds. So Dave, you got some of those questions pulled up that you want to ask? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kelly. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Mays. We've been uh, getting a lot of questions for sure um, from Facebook and from our live feed. So 
we'll roll through those uh, real quick, doctor. And um, maybe if you have quick answers, I think I've vetted out most of them. So we haven't got too much overlap, but some really good ones. So uh, let's start with this. This is one that people in the mountain towns have been asking. Does the snow and cold air kill the virus? And alternatively, will the warming temperatures help? Yeah, so there's you know, still uncertainty around this um, uh, with regard to how temperature and climate affects this particular virus. We don't have a lot of experience with it yet. Um, um, I don't think there's a lot of uh, evidence that the cold climates are likely to, um, to slow the spread of this disease, but, but uh, a lot of viruses like this one are particularly sensitive to, to hot and dry conditions. And so there is some expectation that perhaps we could see a slowing of, trans, uh, of transmission when we get to warmer temperatures, particularly in, in higher, drier climates like we are in many mountain areas. Great. Uh, here's one from Finn. Once you're infected, are you immune going forward? Uh, most likely, yes. The infection should generate some uh, some immunity um, as our you know body recognizes this and has generated antibodies for it. Uh, if this virus is like a lot of the other viruses that that uh, we studied and known, uh, there there should be natural immunity built up in in the pop in our populations as a result of being exposed to it. Great. Uh, and kind of along those lines, this is from CD. Do you have any insight about how people will be able to tell if they were infected and now recovered? Yeah, ultimately we will have uh, antibody-based tests for this virus like we've developed for, for others. And those, are, uh, those tests are, are underway. I mean, that's, that's the, um, that, that kind of test, looking for antibodies um, in the body will tell us whether someone's ever been exposed and their immune system has then reacted um, and um, adapted to that. And so uh, likely we will have those kind of tests over the, uh, sometime over the next 12 to 18 months and be able to get a much better handle on who's been exposed and who's likely to, ha to have built up resistance now. Um, this one is from Amanda. I live with an at-risk person. I have no symptoms. Should I not stay at home with her until this is over? So how, is, how do you feel interaction with at-risk people, especially if you live with them? Yeah, it is best practice to, tr to, to also to try to limit uh, interaction with at-risk uh, people in, in your household. Um, you know, having separate bedrooms, um, separate bathroom facilities if you can, um, and just practicing be, being vigilant on, on, you know, cleaning surfaces that you might, you might share. Um, uh, uh, those are very important, along with you, you know, uh, yourself, um, if you're living with someone with an at-risk person, just being extra cautious about trying to limit your interaction with others outside who, you know, who could be um, uh, transmitting the, the virus. Uh, this is from Nina. How are those in contact with our first community transmission case being advised to behave with work, gloves, mask, um, disclosure to the employer? Yeah, so people who are uh, people who have are, are documented uh, to be have, have been in contact with confirmed cases, there are very established pro protocols for, for isolation for those individuals for a 14 week period um, to, um, to, to see if any symptoms um, uh, develop. And those, uh, so those, uh, those contacts are, um, uh, are, are advised to follow fairly strict self-isolation um, procedures, including you know, limiting their, uh, really you know, limiting their, themselves to staying at home over that 14, uh, week, uh, 14 day period, I'm sorry, um, and then uh, limiting their interaction with any, anyone else over that period, including through the, the workplace. Um, here are a couple kind of related to lung capacity and, and when it gets down into your chest. I know when I was sick in February, I was really glad that it stayed up in my head and my throat and I was out for almost four days, which is one of the sickest I've been, but it never got into my chest. And I am someone who has asthma, so I was really glad about that. But a couple of questions we got. Um, can you address people with asthma concerns? And then also, can you confirm that smokers, particularly vapors, are at a much higher risk of infection than serious illness? Yeah, certainly. So this, this, this virus, you know, creates the most trouble uh, in the lungs. It attacks the lungs, the major receptors are in the lungs. Um, and that's what creates the complications from this infection is 
lung infection and um, problems. And so certainly people with pre-existing um, uh, lung and breathing conditions, including asthma, are at, at higher risk, uh, not, at, not at high risk of contracting the infection, but at high risk of developing complications from the infection that could cause health problems. So uh, those people um, need to be very attuned to, the, to, those, um, uh, to those issues. Um, and, um, and so it's, I mean, that, that it's very, um, very important. On the issue of the smokers or another, uh, and, and other, um, you know, people, uh, vapors as well, those are behaviors, certainly for smoking, got very strong evidence that that significantly elevates uh, the, the risk of complications from this condition. So best thing you can do is to try to quit now. You know, lungs can recover, start to show important signs of recovery within 24 hours of stopping smoking. Uh, vaping, um, uh, the, the same issue, has the potential to, to uh, impede lung function uh, and therefore can, can make you at high risk for complications. Awesome. Uh, a couple more. Here's another one on the lung uh, from someone in Park City. Uh, can we tell shortness of breath from altitude versus shortness of breath from coronavirus? Uh, we are at 8,000 feet, and if we think we could be positive, um, where should we go? Yeah, that is a, that is a compli fact, complicating factor in understanding this condition, distinguishing this, the symptoms of this condition at, at higher altitude. The shortness of breath, particularly for people who are recently, who are not adjusted to altitude, who have recently come to altitude, um, uh, being able to distinguish shortness of breath because of the altitude versus shortness of breath as a possible signal, a symptom of this infection, uh, that, that, can, that can be difficult to, to, uh, to distinguish. Um, uh, the best advice of if you're experiencing, you know, significant difficulty in, in breathing, um, that's the time to seek medical advice. That is a, that is a legitimate reason to reach out to call your, your physician uh, and get checked out. All right, let's go with um, two more doctor if we can, and then we'll get you back to your uh, work that you're doing. Um, why is it taking five to 10 days and maybe longer to get test results back? Uh, when so few people are allowed to test. And another question that we got, we got a, quite a few on the testing. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm kind of narrowing it down. Um, so why is it taking so long and why do we have so few tests right now? Yeah, this has been the major stumbling block for our, our response to this uh, epidemic in the U.S. We were slow to produce uh, testing uh, strategies. Uh, we've been slow in disseminating those um, those testing capabilities out to labs across the country, both public health labs as well as private labs. Um, that bottleneck is, is supposed to be getting better, but we're still far from an ideal situation. Um, we've got still have limited testing capabilities in many areas, particularly in areas that are more distant from like our, our the public health laboratories that often are in our state capitals where our state health departments are located. So what accounts for the delay, uh, even once you capture samples, those, those have got to be transported out to the public health lab or another commercial lab that can do the test. That can take a day or two. Then you've got to have the, the, the workforce to do the test, to run the test, interpret the results. And depending on the staffing levels in these labs, that's what causes the two to three to even five day delay sometimes in getting test results back. We hope that that's gonna to continue to get better um, as labs step up and as testing becomes more widely available, but it's still a big problem for us here in the US. All right, great. And then last one, and this is starting to really pop up in the uh, Colorado towns, but um, talking about with the uh, closures of restaurants and bars to only um, takeout service. Uh, Chris in Glenwood, I'm seeing a lot of requests to take to get takeout from restaurants to help our service industry. I have been fearful to do that as I don't know if that is really safe to do so. What's your opinion on that? And would that help lower? Yeah, what's your opinion on that? In general, I think this can be a safe strategy. We have, we have evidence on this as well. It's been played out. These are uh, Takeout strategies have had to be used in China and in South Korea and in Europe that have other major outbreaks. Uh, just being safe about it when you have food food delivery, it's best if the deliver deliverer can drop the food off at your door. You can pay online. You don't have to share a pin or sign for anything or exchange a credit card. That will limit you know uh, transmission. Um, uh, and then just being real careful as you unpack food, put it on your plates. Just wash your hands after you do that before you eat. 
um, that's going to cut any risk of any transmission from you know viruses being on on the surface. And so you can definitely be safe. Safe ways of continuing to enjoy takeout food from our great restaurants. Great, awesome. Well, that uh, was really great. Despite the fact that you lost power, I'm glad we can see you again, Dr. Mays. I want to really thank everybody um, today for joining us. Uh, this will li live on our Facebook feeds and as well as on our, our websites. Um, uh, our thanks again to Dr. Mays for taking time out of his busy schedule to get uh, give us some time and talk about this. I think it's really helpful. Really a lot of thanks to Kelly for putting this together and working with all our editors across our Swift properties. A uh, reminder that this video will be available um, and we'll keep it out there. Uh, hopefully we can do something like this again, um, either with Dr. Mays or another one of our great healthcare people uh, in Colorado. Uh, again, I'm David Krauss from the Aspen Times, along with Kelly Geary Agnew from Swift Communications. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Mays. So please, everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.